You're on. Intro. I'm not falling for that. Do you the do intro. the intro. You do do the the, I'm intro. not falling for do it. Do the intro, brother. He always do this to me. He get me starting the intro, then he cuts me off and does the intro. That's we have thing. a we have a goat in the house, and before I even say his name, you're doing the intro today. We got the most requested. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> today we have one of the craziest, <laughs> most requested guests I could possibly ever imagine. Eric Bischoff, ladies and gentlemen! Yeah! Yeah! And still, hey, former C, former WCW, greatest wrestling manager, entertainer, and probably entrepreneur of all time. The only one to ever go against Vince McMahon and win. Mm. The one to still be standing, 10 feet tall, never behind, always in front. An innovator, a class above the rest. Definitely the best looking guy at this table, <laughs> right? No, wait, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. Are you talking about our guest, right? I'm Eric Bishop, ladies and gentlemen! Yeah! <laughs> Wow, this is incredible that's, to have you that's, here. That's a hell of an intro. I've never had one anything like that. That's <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. Do you see what it's like to be sitting in front of a goat? Oh, yeah. Because no, more normally like the fighters are sitting in front of you, but now you get to sit in front of this man right here. Yeah, he the man. He well, last, man. Time, last time I saw you, we were in uh, TNA together. Yeah, yeah, TNA. You didn't know that. For a Wait, minute. For a minute. I used to be a pro wrestler, bro. No. Yeah. Where you wrestled? Thunder from down under? TNA. Tits and ass. Wait, really? Yeah, TNA Wrestling, Spike Television. I thought you only did a little stint. I didn't know you no, actually could no, get I in was, there. I was um, part of the main event mafia. You didn't do your research, buddy. He, oh, you you were wearing the dress, right? You did the whole the dress thing, right? Oh, wow. You <laughs> right? Tito you said Tito was there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah oh, him. wow. Tito Ortiz. I do remember. You dressed up like the housemaid, right? You had the dress Why on. Why are you disrespecting me? I'm not. If you disrespecting me in front of the What was your, front, what front was your outfit? I, I, we wore suits and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was very badass. Looking. It was badass, man. I really enjoyed doing that. I, I I always wanted to be a pro wrestler, and there was like a, a dream come true. But then you know it's it was short lived. They never trained me. Uh, yeah, and it's it's not something you can dabble in. You know, you've got to just like anything else, just like your fighting career, you got to pour yourself into it to to be able to be successful and, and have fun doing it and be proud of it. Yeah, it was it was fun. You know, my hardest part was what you call it, the monologues. Yeah. How you guys do that, man? It's just it's just repetition. It's no different than being an athlete. You know, you just do it over and over and over again until it becomes almost second nature. Mo yeah. Most of the speeches in the ring you have to memorize, or you just make it up as you go. For me personally, I would have a pretty good idea of what the story was or what I was trying to communicate, and I would, for the most part, improv it. I knew what I was doing and where I was going with the story, but how I got there was generally an improv. Yeah, it was hard for me. They give me the lines when I got there. I could try to memorize it. And most of the time when I talk on the mic after a fight, you know, it's just you're happy if you won and stuff. So you just say whatever you want. But this, you got to kind of stick to it. And then you got to look at the camera. And I was like, wow. you know, It's like acting. Yeah. You know, it's it's completely different. But it's live. It's like the fans right there interacting with you and stuff. Yeah. The it's fans a lot of are pressure. Great. It's a lot of pressure. One, one thing I wanted to know off the break, though, before we jump into this podcast and go into detail, I mean... With all due respect, you're probably one of the greatest wrestling entrepreneurs we've ever seen. And is it true you're a black bone karate? Yeah. So that was that wasn't fake because half the internet was saying that was just part of the part of the skit, part of the character. The no. other half of the internet was like, no, he's a real deal. No, I got my black belt in '79 from uh, Gordon Franks, who was a world super lightweight champion at one point, and Professional Karate Association, which was before MMA really became a thing. Um, Pat Worley, John Worley, those are all big names and. The world of karate back then and i yeah i got my black belt then and fought for another year or two afterwards and then realized that there was no money in it for me at least mm -hmm. and got out of it but yeah i spent a lot of time doing it if mma was around back then you think you would have went that way uh, absolutely because i wrestled in high school i was oh, an amateur wow. wrestler i wrestled uh, greco-roman after high school i was in the aau uh Greco-Roman and freestyle teams in the state of Minnesota. Dan Chandler was the coach. I don't oh. know if you know Dan. Oh, wow. Greco-Roman guy. So, yeah, I, I mean, I wrestled for quite a while and then got into to martial arts. So I think it would have been a good move back then. It, it just wasn't around. It wasn't around. Is Greco-Roman, is that the reason why you got into pro wrestling? Well, it's an interesting story. It's really amateur wrestling. Um, there was a guy in Minnesota named Vern Gagne. He had a regional wrestling promotion called the AWA. He had a show on ESPN five days a week, right? And Vern was also an amateur wrestler at University of Minnesota. I think he made the Olympic team at 43 or somewhere in there. 
Uh, but he's Vern really supported amateur wrestling. And I had an idea one day that I wanted to try to pitch somebody. And I thought, well, I'm just going to play the amateur wrestling card. You know, hey, Vern, went to Minnetonka High School. He's just down the road in Mound, Minnesota. Told him I had an idea. And he said, sure, come on in. Pitched him my idea. And he hired me. That's how I got into the wrestling business. Really was indirectly through amateur wrestling. Oh, wow. Yeah. Damn. I mean, most of the people that have been seeing all the Netflix hype with uh, Vince McMahon story, they understand that you went to war with uh, WWF at the time, mm -hmm. and you had a WCW Monday Night Nitro. You were the general manager, and you really brought this whole thing to life, and you were probably the most successful when going to battle against the WWF that we've ever seen. For 83 Weeks, also the name of your podcast. Yeah. Um, can you kind of just bring us into that? I know a lot of people know the story, but just bring us up to speed on that initial intro of you joining WCW and creating this huge hysteria in the U.S. Well, I, you know, working for Vern Gagne, unfortunately, Vern, uh, he was losing a lot of money trying to keep his wrestling company alive. And I went for three, four, five months without even getting a paycheck working for him. Wow. Uh, it was it was tough. I knew once I got out, I'd never get back in. So I was reluctant to, to get out of the business. But I couldn't take it anymore. I had two young kids at home, and they were turning off the heat and the power and all kinds of other things. So I knew I had to get a job, and I had heard that WCW was looking for announcers. And again, I was on five days a week, you know, on ESPN, so I had at least something to show them. And I got hired to WC, down on WCW as kind of a backup announcer. Did that for a couple of years, and the opportunity came along to uh, WCW Turner Broadcasting and wanted a, an executive producer, somebody to kind of revamp the look of the show. I threw my name in a hat, got hired, and just kind of ate my way up the food chain, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people, there was VPs at the time. I believe his name was uh, Jim Ross. Was that one of the VPs you beat out to become the general manager? Yeah, of the I, show? Think, I think Jim was interested in, in that position. Uh, probably was really had more credentials than I did, to be honest about it. Uh, I'd never worked in a management position in wrestling before. So there was a lot of reasons why other people would have been better choices. But for whatever reason, I got the job and had some fun. Yeah, I mean, we go through the the roster, which we'll talk about, like all the wrestlers that were in WCW. But talk to me about that initial moment where now you have to go to battle against Vince McMahon, who's kind of like the kingpin of the U.S. at the time in terms of wrestling. Like, how did you decide how you were going to position WCW to be different? Well, it wasn't really my idea, to be honest with you. It was Ted Turner's idea. I was in a meeting with Ted uh, on something altogether different. And Ted just interrupted me in the middle of my sales pitch and said, oh. Eric, uh, what do we got to do to uh, be competitive with uh, the, the Vince McMahon? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. Like, I had never thought of that before. It was, you know, the idea of outperforming WWE or even competing them was just not on my bingo card at the time. So I, I had to punt. I knew I didn't want to bullshit him because you can't bullshit a good bullshitter, right? So I said, uh, Ted, we, you know, they're in prime time, and we're on Saturday night at six oh five Eastern, three oh five Pacific. You can't really compete, you know. And he turned and he looked at a guy by the name of Scott Sassa, who was like the number two in charge of Turner at the time. He looked at Scott and said, uh, Scott, uh, give Eric here two hours every Monday night, go head to head with WWE." Wow, that's what I said. In my mind, I'm going, "Fuck, <laughs> now what?" I, I didn't think that was going to happen. And I literally, honest to God's truth, I left that meeting stunned. So was everybody else in the room. They didn't see it coming. My boss was there. I walked out. I, there's an, there was an atrium, you know, in the middle of CNN Center, and there was a bridge that connects the North Building and the South Building. And I stood in the middle of that atrium. I'm looking up at the CNN Center, and I thought, I'm either going to, this is either going to make me or break me. There's no, there's nothing in between. And I went to my office, I locked my door, didn't tell anybody what just happened. I went into my office, locked the door, told my assistant not to bother me. And I made a list of everything that WWE was good at. Everything I could think of. And then I made another list of all the things that I could do to be completely different than them. Mm. For example, their characters were all they're really human cartoons, the garbage man, the crazy dentist, you know, the, the dwarf Indian. They're all like human cartoon characters because they were appealing towards, towards teens and preteens. 
I couldn't be better at them than that. They'd been doing it for too long and they were really good at it. So I said, okay, if I can't be better than them, I don't want to be less than them. The only thing that's left is be different. So I made a list of every way I could be different. Said, okay, they're really good at teens and preteens. I'm going after 18 to 49 year old men because that's an underserved market. They're, they're taped, they tape their show every week. I'm gonna go live every week. I, I just made that list of everything that I could think of to do differently than them. And the better than, less than, different than principle kind of was emerged out of that. I, I used that same template for just about everything I, I could to try to be distinctive in, from the WWE and it worked. Who was the first um, wrestlers you wanted to sign when you did that? Did you have a, uh, Well, I already had Hulk. You know, Hulk came with us in 94, mm. so he was already on board. Randy Savage came along shortly after that. Um, it, there was really nobody rampage that I was, that I wanted, that I had to go after. Not to sound arrogant, but they were coming to me. Mm. We were so hot and we were the place to be. And whenever talent could get out of their contracts at WWE, I'd be the first place they'd call. Wow. So explain to me then the situation like Rampage, you make up a good point. Like who's the first person you want? Like me and Rampage always talk about when MMA promotions come into play. They got to go get top-notch fighters to sell tickets and pay-per-view or like these one-off events. They need great main cards. How did you decide then the positioning of Hulk Hogan? Because if you already had him, how did you decide, all right, we're going to turn this babyface American hero, larger-than-life character yeah. heel? Like, how do you decide that? Well, that's a really interesting story. And Darren Prince and I uh, and Matilda were talking about that on the way over here because it wasn't my idea. Oh, wow. right. Now, here's this is a fascinating story, and I'll try to do a good job telling it. But about eight months or so before Hulk Hogan turned heel in July, I had already been working with Hulk for a year, year and a half. And it was pretty obvious that the audience really wasn't quite with the red and yellow good guy Hulk Hogan the way they used to be. They were still with him, just not to the same level of intensity. And there was a smattering of booze every now and then, right? So I had the bright idea of going down to Hulk Hogan's house and talk him into being a heel or a bad guy. So at the time I had my own plane, I was a pilot. So I flew down to Florida and went to Hawk's house. It was in the middle of the day, in a, on a weekday. Get to his house, big, beautiful home on the ocean, Clearwater Beach. Get to his house, he hands me a beer. It's like two, two in the afternoon. We sit down in his office, we're shooting the shit. And I start giving him my sales pitch about, hey, Hawk, do you ever think about maybe turning heel? And, he stopped, he looked at me and looked at his, by the way, this is a beautiful watch. I dig this. That's the new JX one? Oh, I have, nice. The Jackson watch? I, I haven't had something that nice on my wrist in a long time. But he looks at his watch, he says, um, well, brother, it's three o'clock. Kids are getting out of school. You can take that beer with you. Thanks for coming by. Wow. <laughs> he was upset? Not not in a mean, aggressive way, but in a, okay, I've heard everything I need to hear and I got other stuff to do, so thank you for coming by so long. He was very polite. Mm, wow. I've never been thrown out of somebody's house <laughs> that polite. That means beat life. it, Rampage. That means but, but beat it. Yeah. When he said, I got to go get my kids, that was my cue. Mm. And then, now fast forward. So now we're in 1996. We're in probably April, or yeah, probably September on April, May 1996. We've got the wrestling story going on where Scott Hall comes down through the crowd. You don't know who you don't know who I am, or you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here thing. And the following week, Kevin Nash shows up, right? And they tell everybody they got a third guy. Well, meanwhile, Hulk Hogan's here in California on a mountain somewhere north of LA shooting a movie called Santa with Muscles. And he was <laughs> like, <laughs> You saw the movie, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I could tell by that chuckle rampage. Uh, <laughs> so he couldn't leave. So I fly down. He calls me up and says, hey, man, I want to talk to you, you know, about what we're doing creatively. Because he wasn't scheduled to come back until, like, October. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll fly. So I flew into L.A. from Atlanta, rented a car, drove up to some mountain somewhere in the middle of freaking nowhere. And I walk into his trailer, right? It's late. It's like 11 o'clock, 11.30. I'm beat from flying all day. I go to his trailer, open it up, and it's just like a haze of blue smoke. He's in there with a box of Cuban cigars <laughs> and a case of beer on ice. So we sit down, catch up, small talk, you know, nothing big. 
he leans forward and he says, so, who's the third man? Because that was the mystery, right? Scott Hall and Kevin Nash had a third man, and we don't know who it is. And I didn't want to tell him because I'd kept it a secret. It was important that nobody knows until the day of the event. That was the mystery, right? I didn't want it to leak out. Now, Hulk is, I trust Hulk. He, he's, I trust him with anything. He's a, he's a very honorable guy in that respect. But he also is like a child when he gets excited. He can't help but to share stuff that he probably shouldn't. <laughs> and he doesn't, so, and he gets so caught up in it, he sometimes he knows he shouldn't do it, but he doesn't know until it's too late. He already spills the beans. So I didn't want to tell him. It was kind of like the Ted Turner thing. I didn't want to answer the question because I didn't know how. So I said, well, Hulk, uh, who do you think it should be? Answer a question with a question gimmick, right? And he leans forward again. And whenever he does this thing, when he strokes that Fu Manchu, then you know <laughs> the, leg, the leg is about to drop yeah. one way or the other. And he goes, you're looking at him, brother. <laughs> Whoa, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> that Insane. was it. So it was really his idea to turn heel. And that really was the seismic shift. Like we were competitive with WWE before all that. You know, they'd win one, we'd win one. It was back and forth. But once the NWO thing hit, Hulk Hogan turns heel. Different story. Yeah. So who was going to be the third if you didn't let him? Sting. Sting was going to be the third man. Here's a funny, well, it's not wow. funny. But here's a part, okay? So again, Hogan's in California doing a movie. I've already asked him to turn heel once. He threw me out of the house with, with the beer. He let me take the beer. That's cool. <laughs> but, but he still threw me out of the house. And now he's off doing a movie. I need a surprise. I need a baby face, a good guy, to turn heel for the story to work, right? Sting was the only guy that would have made any sense. So I go to Sting while Hogan's doing a movie. I go to Sting, and it takes me two weeks to convince him to turn heel. He's a very, Steve Borden, Sting, was a very, uh, very analytical guy. You know, he second guesses everything, but very analytical. But it took me two weeks to convince him it was a good idea. He finally says, okay, I'm going to do it. And he's once he's in, he's all in. He's an ultimate team player, right? He's all excited about it. He's thinking about all the different things he can do as a heel. I'm in California, and I'm flying back to Atlanta going, oh, God. I got to tell Sting that he's no longer the guy that's <laughs> turning heel. <laughs> After I spent two weeks convincing him he needed to be. So I, I sit down with Sting, and he and I had pretty good relationship anyway. We yeah. were friends outside of the business. And I just told him the truth. I said, here's what I'm faced with, brother. This is, it is what it is. And he was disappointed. I think he was disappointed in some ways, but he was also relieved. He was willing to do it, but I'm not sure his heart was 100% in it yet. It would have been by day of, but there was a sense of relief. But I wasn't sure Hulk could follow through. Because he's always, and I know him pretty well, he's always the kind of guy that'll second guess himself. He'll second guess, no matter what the decision is, he'll find a way to second guess himself. So I, I wasn't 100% sure he'd follow through because there was a lot at stake. So I kept Sting ready to go. Sting was ready to beat, to replace Hulk Hogan the day of the event if Hulk Hogan backed out at the last minute. Oh, Wow. It was a crazy story, right? Yeah, I mean, the, crazy these, story. these are like icons. These are like guys I grew up watching. I mean, I grew up watching these storylines come to life. So to like hear the behind the scenes of how that got put together. I mean, you kind of like shaped the way wrestling was formed after that. And I didn't leave. High, I think I went to like every high school party wearing an NWO shirt, like coming out of the party. And, and like, that was, that was a, like the thing to do. And that was a cool thing about it. And the truth behind that is I, we didn't come up with that logo. Uh, a, a designer down at Disney MGM Studios where we happened to be filming a show at that point did. We said, hey, we need something that kind of stands for New World Order. It's a wrestling thing. What do you got? They came back with like five different logo designs. One of them was the NWO logo. And the cool thing about that shirt is that's the first time you can wear a wrestling shirt into a bar hoping to get laid and, <laughs> and, and maybe have a shot because it's a wrestling shirt, but you only knew it if you were a wrestling fan. It was kind of like a secret handshake. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of badass looking. It was cool. You can yeah. maybe get laid. And it was a wrestling shirt. It was one of the first ones that come out that, because otherwise they're like pictures yeah. of other guys. And, yeah, you know. half naked on your, yeah. On your yeah, chest. Yeah, it's like, dude. Yeah, yeah. His, his type of, you know, wear. That's what, <laughs> he wears pro wrestling stuff all the time. I mean, I love the, the vintage wrestling t-shirt. The vintage stuff. I mean, is that yeah. why you always wear NWO when you go to the bar? Because you have trouble getting laid? 
<laughs> I, I don't have trouble getting laid. Really? I, I don't. So that's why you always wear an NWO shirt? But I, I, I don't have trouble getting laid. That's, that got nothing to do with it. Well, no, like when you go to a bar, you always have trouble. No, I don't have trouble getting laid. I'm just making sure There's so my on, guest it's only It's only in Orange County. That's on. That's the only time I got trouble getting laid. Here. Why? Like, Why? What is it about Orange County? I don't know. The, the girls don't dig me here. I don't know. Then what are you doing here? I yeah, probably you doing? don't spend a lot of time here. Then do well, you? Not, not when I'm trying to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> what What kind of things were you looking for, though? Like, for example, one of the most iconic stories of, of you coming on the scene and taking over is when you have Lex Luger walk out, right? Mm. And so he was supposed to be under contract with Vince McMahon, and right. apparently... There was no contract, and you knew about this, so you just what you went over to his house, drop off some cash. <laughs> You're coming with us? No, it's like you know, Lex had been with WCW for a long time. He was very close with Steve Steve Borden, Sting. They were best friends and business partners. So Sting came to me and said, "Hey, you know, Lex's contract is coming up in WWE. Would you be interested?" And I and I said flat out, "No, I'm not," because I had worked with him before, and he was kind of a jackass. Just arrogant and, you know, thought way too highly of himself. And I just didn't want to work with him again. So I, I said, no, not interested. And then Steve worked on me for a couple of weeks, really worked on me. And I said, okay, look, I'll talk to him. No promises. I'll talk. So we met secretly at Sting's house and me, Sting, and Lex. And he convinced me that he realized that, in his previous run at WCW, he was kind of a dick. He didn't really live up to his own expectations or ours. And he was very humble and very honest, like just laid it out. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm an easy sell when people are honest with me. You know, it's not hard. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to give this a shot. But now when he left, he was making 750000 a year guaranteed, right? And this was back in 94, wow. so it was wow. a fair amount of money. Um, when he came back, I said, here's how we're going to do it, Lex. I'm going to give you 150 grand a year. So I cut his pay by 600 grand. I said, I'll give you 150 a year. If it works out at some point, we'll sit down and talk about renegotiating your deal. Cause I'm, I think I'm going to, I'm going to test this guy. See if he really, really wants to be here and prove himself. He didn't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it. Shook hands. And I went, all right, now, now I kind of really believe him. And within probably 60 days, 90 days, they rewrote his contract and took him back to where he was before and then some. Wow. That's insane. That's insane. I mean, at the time, though, was the, was the production company or was the cable house? Like, who was paying? Who was giving all this money for you to go get all this talent? Well, the company, WCW, was owned by Turner Broadcasting. Got it. So, so Turner was funding this operation. Yes. And they wanted you to, whatever you needed, you got to go. No, no. no? That's, a, that's a narrative that's out there, you know, the internet kind of thing. But no, it's not true at all. When I took over WCW as president, they were doing $24 million a year gross sales and losing $10 million a year in the process. Jesus. So my first goal, in fact, when I was given the job, it was like either turn this thing around and make profit or Ted's going to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my first day on the job. So my first goal was to get costs under control, and I did a good job at that. And that was like in 94, it was 93, 94. So by 1995, I'd made enough of the right moves in terms of cost cutting, reducing the travel budget, reducing the production budget tremendously by producing all of our shows at the Disney MGM Studios, because there's an economy of scale when you do that. You could shoot in bulk, really. Um, so I just saved, the, started saving tons of money and then as I was doing that, they started giving me more to work with. So that in 94, when Hulk Hogan opportunity came along, I had already proven that I kind of knew how to manage the budget. So they gave me a little more rope. And every time they gave me a little bit more rope, I'd ask for more and I'd give more back. You know, we just started having success after success after success. And then the money becomes easier so that if I do need to make a move, number one, I always had a budget set aside. I knew what I could do and what I couldn't do once I had that budget. But if I needed something outside of the budget, I would just ask, explain why, show them the math. Almost always get it. At what point did you know, like, what was the biggest turning point? Was it that, that moment that Lex walks out? Was it the moment 
Hulk turns heel? Is it the moment that you decide to go, you know, non baby face and everybody's like a big tough guy that we could kind of get behind? Kind of like the original Attitude Era came from WCW in a it way. It really did. So, like, at what point was the turning point where you realized? There was no, you know, epiphany. There was yeah. no one moment. It was just a series of things. You know, the, Lex coming out, you know, that was actually a much bigger deal because a lot of the research we did before we launched Nitro, we did focus groups all over the country, wrestling fans. And the one common denominator they all had was that they loved surprises. It's one of the reasons people love watching wrestling is because something's always happening that you didn't expect to happen. So I knew when we launched that show, in order to be different than the WWE, I had to provide more of that, more of those surprises. Lex just happened to be there. Everybody in WWE thought he was under contract. Mm -hmm. He wasn't because they were sloppy at the time. They weren't too concerned about it. So they got around to renewing your contract whenever they got around to it because they didn't know Lex was talking to me. They didn't know that I was going to use him as a surprise. So I brought Lex in and <laughs> live TV, TV, everybody, he walks out. Even people in my own production team thought he was still under contract to the WWF. The audience flipped out and that was a big moment. And it told the audience that our show was going to be different than what they're used to seeing in WWE. But Hulk Hogan turning heel, another really, really big moment. The cruiserweight division, the Rey Mysterios. I know you guys were jamming with Rey here. Guys like Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero that most of the audience had never seen before, they brought a style of wrestling that was brand new to them and exciting. That had a lot to do with it. So it was a combination of things, really. During the moment, I, I know there's like a, a story we were we were talking about it earlier that you bring Macho Man over, right? Mm -hmm. And when you bring Macho Man over, was that Hulk? Because Hulk and Macho Man were friends, right, at the time? Or was that you kind of going to him saying, I know they don't want to take care of you at WWE? Or how did that work? It was Hulk, Hulk and Randy had a very weird relationship. It was definitely a love-hate relationship. And depending on what part of their careers we're talking about, sometimes it was more love than hate, and sometimes more hate than love. But <laughs> uh, it was Hulk. Hulk, Hulk called me and said, hey, Randy wants, wants to give you a shout. Do you, would you take his call? <laughs> would I take his call? <laughs> oh, yeah, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I talked to Randy and he, again, put it all on the table. He said, Vince McMahon thinks I'm done as a wrestler. All he wants me to do is be a color commentator and I don't think I'm done. I still think I've got some gas in the tank. I want to come over. Sure, brother. Now here's the cool thing about Randy. Randy had a deal with Slim Jim, but by the way, he still has. I was in a 7-Eleven, Denver, wherever I was a couple of weeks ago, and there's a big uh, display of Slim Jims, and Randy Savage is still on the on I saw a commercial. I saw a commercial this morning. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. Yeah. It brings a tear to my eye. I love it. Oh, yeah. he's a legend. Well, yeah. But Randy came over when I said, sure, Randy, I'll hire you, and I paid him 750 grand a year was his, his salary. And the reason I know that is because he brought – Slim Jim with him, and they bought a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars sponsorship in my show. So I got Randy for free. Wow! I had to give, what a up, deal. I had to give up home some, run. I had to give up some airtime, but it was all the Slim Jims I could eat, and they paid Randy's contract. It was awesome for two years. Wow! Uh, was he really uh, married to uh, Elizabeth? He was at one time, not when he came to work for me. They had already been divorced, but he was at one time. Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I used to have a big crush on her, boy. Oh, she was a smoke oh, show. So did Hulk Elizabeth Hogan, knows. according to Randy. But it's not true. But Randy <laughs> Randy always thought that Hulk had a little thing going on with, with Elizabeth. It, it wasn't true. But wasn't that's true. A, Randy was crazy jealous. Crazy Wait, jealous. Wait, Randy thought that Hulk and Elizabeth were... It was a storyline about something like that. Yeah, well, he, he yeah. thought that, you know, Hulk intentionally is a rib or whatever, grabbed Elizabeth's ass when she was coming out of the ring. And he, the story, now I wasn't working with either one of them back then, <laughs> but Randy was psycho jealous. Like, of what? Like wrestlers wanting to. Getting wow. too close. He, he, they would go to the building and Randy would make her sit in her own dressing room and not come out and wouldn't allow people to come in. Wow. Like he he didn't want her anywhere near the business. And of course she ends up being a valet, right? Now right. she's in the thick of things. Well, why why did she why did he allow her to be like such a main part of his storyline then? I don't think he had any control over it. It just kind of took on a life of its own. 
And he tried to adjust to it. Now, by the time Randy came to work for me, and Elizabeth was working, in fact, Randy's the one that suggested I bring Elizabeth in. Mm. It was a crazy world I lived in. <laughs> <laughs> I forget how crazy it is until I start telling these stories. Yeah, that's nuts. So you get Randy Savage. And at the time, could you use the name Macho Man Randy Savage? Yeah, he owned it. Oh, he owned it. Yeah. Because that was an issue with Razor Ramon, right? Yeah. So some of them you could own the name, some of them you couldn't? Very few. Like if, if they were... If they had a character name in WWE, we couldn't touch it. But a lot of these guys, like Randy Savage, they were using that name before they ever went to work for WWE. So they couldn't, mm. they didn't own it. So you get him and then he says, hey, I, I want to bring in my wife, Elizabeth. They were really married in real life, right? Yeah, they, they were married at one point. Wow. They had been divorced. Randy comes to work for me. They're still divorced. In fact, she was married to another guy, an attorney down in Miami at the time. And uh, Randy... Got excited about an idea he had that involved Elizabeth, and he called me and said, "Hey, you know, I want to bring her in. Here's the storyline I want to use her in. Can can we make it happen?" I said, "Sure, no problem." And she came back. They worked great together. Divorce. She, they, they worked together, and she ended up hooking up with Lex Luger. Yeah, that was a that was a kind of a tragic story, though. Very right? tragic. A ends well, in a bad way. What? Well, yeah. well, I, I don't know that story. She OD'd. She OD'd. That's I didn't how, know that's that. How Elizabeth yeah. passed away. She was in a hotel room with Lex Luger, I think. Right. Or a house oh, or at, his, at his home. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Yeah, they had had a relationship in WCW for quite a while. She had divorced her attorney husband, and her and Lex had, and Lex was married. And uh, and and by the way, I know Lex wouldn't mind me. I usually wouldn't talk about somebody's personal life like this, but Lex and I have become very close. Oh, nice. He's he is a better person now than he's ever been in his life, and mm -hmm. he's very open about this stuff. So I don't want anybody to think that yeah, I'm sharing this kind of thing uh, without permission so to speak yeah, but, I'll only say what you can no worries but Lex was addicted he was abusing pain pills a lot she got into it and they were both using one it was early early in the morning when she died and she OD'd oh but, wow you see you heard that Barry you need to leave that stuff alone you see how it, it hurts yeah. people and it messes up lives I don't and, touch any of that what I don't touch pain pills or anything. I've never. Oh, it's the other stuff. You, you, you're doing. You're doing something else. No, brother. It's called dieting. He's mad that I have a six pack. I think you got me confused with someone else, brother. I ain't Rashad Evans. I've got Chill a out. one pack. I'm working on my six <laughs> yeah. pack. I think I saw two this morning. Yeah, I'm not sure. Got to do some pull ups. I'm gonna. Eat, I'm gonna come back when I get all. Good. I had a six pack last night. <laughs> a donuts. A beer. <laughs> Yeah, we could tell, brother. Good thing you wore the jacket today. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, that's, that's rude. That's, why? Are you going to embarrass me in front of, uh, uh, you know, say I'm, I'm one of his biggest He's fans. Are you going to embarrass, like embarrass me in front of the guest? Are you going to embarrass me in front of the guest? You're trying to make it seem like I'm on juice in front of the legend? Do? He a legend. All right, all right, all right. Settle down, settle down. Go this comes back to me. The referee in me comes I'll go the top ropes right now, brother. I'll show you what it's like. I'll Diamond Dallas page your head in the ground. No, chill. You know what he taught me last time we here? Give him my belt. Chill. Wait, but at the time, there's one thing that, that that I do. You know what, Rampage? It's it's a good day, and we're brothers. I love you, brother. So <laughs> one thing that I wanted to tell you is that, like, I remember uh, hearing a story though because Hulk Hogan is like one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, and Macho Man Randy Savage is as well. And I remember a story saying where Hulk was like, "Hey, why is Elizabeth staying at this hotel where his wife was at in like Boca Raton or something?" He finds out someone's there, and then he's. He's like, hey, I ain't going to stay in the middle of this because I got Macho Man's back and Hulk was a good guy. So he's like, hey, you know, the stuff's here, but I don't see her. And then Macho Man comes to Hulk Hogan's wife's hotel room. Is this a true story? Yeah, I've heard versions of that. Yeah. What, what is the actual story? What do you think or what is or am I just hearing rumors from multiple stories? No, you just it, it's a lot of that. You know, yeah. you're hearing different stories from different people all about the same subject. So they kind of vary a little bit. Yeah. They're, they're, look, Hulk never had anything going on. Yeah. With Elizabeth. Randy was convinced he did. And a lot of people would stir stuff up because, you know, wrestlers are wrestlers, right? They, they like to watch other people react. That's how they make a living, getting people to react. And when there's no audience, they get each other to react mm -hmm. and work each other over. They call it ribbing, but it's mm, sometimes not so much fun. They call it rimming? Ribbing. Rimming. Not rimming. Uh -huh. <laughs> Rampage is used ribbing. to rimming. All oh, right, BBI. Oh, my bad, my bad. Are you used to rimming? <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Are no, you no. used to rimming? Was that the first thing that came to no, no, your No, no, that's what I thought he said. Okay, ribbing. Okay. No, I'm glad he clarified. That. Yeah, yeah, me too. Otherwise, your audience is going to think yeah, I'm yeah. talking about something else. I was nervous <laughs> watching you even. <laughs> <laughs> but I, at what time? Because I do know that Hulk Hogan's always been the biggest supporter. Like, even if you watch documentaries about him and Vince McMahon, they hated each other, but he wouldn't let wrestling go down. He would always stand by the wrestling, his comrades. Kind of like how Rampage always supports fighters. It's a cool thing to see people support their industry and their, their people they work with. But is that when 
Hulk and Macho Man's relationship fell apart when this all went down with the wife and this and that. It was a remember when I said you know throughout their yeah. entire careers there's been more love than hate. Yeah, there's you know at one at one point in time they were I won't say bitter enemies but yeah Randy wanted to punch his lights out yeah. and threatened to. Macho Man's the coolest coolest guy of all time. Yeah, he's yeah yeah he's cool. I be, but be honest, he was a legend. Yeah, you, you remember how uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth looked, right? You remember how she used to look, right? Elizabeth, no. Yeah, yeah. You, be honest. If you yeah. Hulk Hogan, would you have tried though? If I was Hulk Hogan, well, you had tried to smash. Be honest. For sure. Ah. <laughs> you a shit friend. Why? I'm never. I'm never. Why? I'm never bringing Bro, a, you a beautiful woman you around you. You were sniffing my girlfriend's shoulders at the at the charity foundation. I was drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, blame it on the al 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 alcohol. Your girlfriend's hot. Oh, uh, see what I got to do it. That's crazy that you would say that out loud. Now I know you sus. Now I gotta watch you. I ain't sus. I'm going out to your girl. No, you sus. Out. No, you sus. How's now, that sus. Now I know you and your trainer be he doing more he, than train. He don't know. He don't know. Now I know you me. and your trainer be doing more than train. Now you got me messed up. Yeah, don't play with my name. <laughs> so one thing I want to know is at, during this point, when was it? And it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know this isn't WCW at the time. But didn't Macho Man's wife end up becoming Lex Luger's partner in WWE? Like, didn't Catherine end up becoming like Lex Luger's like girl in the show as part of his whole? You mean Miss Elizabeth? Yeah, Miss Elizabeth. Yeah, and and at that point, like, because she had been out of the scene for a little bit, mm -hmm. they had been divorced. They yeah, had yeah. divorced. Didn't that drive Macho Man nuts, or did he not? No, care? he. You know, the relationship. I think Randy loved Elizabeth till the day she died and the day he died. Mm. I'm convinced of it, but I, I also think that he he start he looked at her more like his sister. Mm. He loved her, but not in love with her, so to speak. And he was very, still very protective of her. He just wasn't nuts about it. Mm. But he, 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 he was still very protective of her, even though they weren't married. Did you, did you ever feel at a moment like the NWO could have maybe turned into something else or it could have brought a new character, a new life, and could have been something even bigger than what it was? Or do you feel that it ran its course? Well, it definitely ran its course, but it ran its course because it, we because I we didn't have a plan. Mm. You know, the, the idea of creating the NWO before Hulk Hogan joined, right? I knew it was a good idea, but I didn't think it was that good of an idea. It was just something that I thought maybe would last a couple months storyline-wise. And then when Hulk Hogan joined... I went, I agreed to do it. I went, okay, it's more than just a storyline. This is going to be a big, big moment. But there's no way I can honestly tell you I knew it was going to become as big as it did because it really changed professional wrestling. That's something that a lot of people like to say, you know, something changed professional wrestling forever. That one did. The way the audience looked at good guys and bad guys completely changed with the NWO. The idea of a wrestling good guy character was just silly and cheesy at the time. NWO made it cool to be the bad guy. Yeah. And that changed a lot, even into pop culture. And it wasn't just in wrestling. It existed in music as well, hip hop and mm -hmm. in other forms, in feature films. You know, your characters were kind of badass characters with flaws instead of being the John Wayne types. So it changed a lot of things, but a lot of it was just timing. What do you think uh, made um, pro wrestling so so big in in America? What do you think that is? I think re re professional wrestling is a mirror of our culture. It's kind of like our culture on no pun intended steroids. It's a, it's a, a larger a than, larger than life version of of real life. Um, it's simple entertainment, man. It's good guys and bad guys. It's it's a storyline, but it's physical. You know, if you go to a Broadway play, you see great actors and actresses performing, but they're performing the spoken word. And they use their bodies to help make it dramatic. Professional wrestling is like a physical narrative. It's a, it's a story, but it's not the spoken word story. You're seeing it play out with physicality and characters that you hopefully are living through. You know, you either identify with the baby face in the story, you identify with the heel in the story, and you're kind of living your life at home with a beer in your hand, watching those characters do it. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up watching, I got a brother that's like um, six years older than me. 
So I grew up watching it and he used to practice the moves on us. And we, we grown men, you kind of grow up and you kind of say, oh, this is not real. You know, they're not really hating each other, but he was a grown man still talking to us about what's going on in pro wrestling, like his, <laughs> like his real life. But if he was talking to you about a movie he saw, it wouldn't seem that odd, right? right. Or a television series that you're watching, they're talking about it like it's real life. Because you get emotionally attached to the characters and the stories. I mean, there's you know there's a series I'm watching now <clears throat> with my wife streaming called Outlander. It's been out for a while. But it's such amazing storytelling that you fall in love with the characters. You look forward to visiting your friends every night, you know, with a bowl of popcorn. Yeah. A, lo a lot of the people, when you talk about bowl of popcorn, that brings me up a good point. They talk about the characters that you were able to develop and how you developed them as wrestlers in WCW. And I was going through some of the, the characters and kind of the athletes right now, the list. Who are some of the best characters you feel WCW created? Like who are guys you feel you guys created and inherit and then polish up to be better? Um, <clears throat> the first one that comes to mind is Diamond Dallas Page mm. because he was my neighbor. You know, we <laughs> we... We, he was an announcer and I was an announcer, and we both kind of changed our, our trajectory within WCW. But he was my neighbor, and he was a, he was a great guy. Um, but he, if you go back and you watch Diamond Dallas Page from, let's say, 92, 93 into 94, his, his character was kind of obnoxious. You know, he, he stole everybody's gimmick. Like he, he was, he was like a little bit of, of superstar Billy Graham, a little bit of Dusty Rhodes, a little bit of Hulk Hogan, a little bit of Bon Jovi. You know, he just had everybody's gimmick. He thought, well, if you just keep adding gimmicks, eventually one of them's going to get over it, right? And it's just the opposite. He looked like a walking, talking dollar store. <laughs> he just the cheap stuff. Or DDP. That's our guy. He was on the podcast last month. No, I know, yeah. but it, but it's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it is. With it all is, due respect. With all due respect. It is what it is. As long as you say with all due respect. Yeah. Say whatever you want. So one day, you know, he's walking by my office. We're producing a show, and he's got this gold on. He's got a cigar, and he's got blingy sunglasses. I mean, this looks stupid, right? And I, I said, Paige, you've got to lose some of these gimmicks. You know, you're going to get over because he's not a flashy guy. In real life, he is a blue-collar, down-to-earth, big-hearted guy. That's who he is. But he's a blue-collar guy from Jersey. He's not a blingy guy from Miami, and he's not a good enough actor to portray it. So I, I pulled him aside. Oh my God. No, <laughs> but he, he wasn't at the time. He's become a great actor and a great performer. This is really a this is really a compliment. I just take, okay. a, I take a long time. How is this a compliment? Okay. I'd hate to see you offend someone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. But so we started because he trusted me, and we started working together. And I said, "Man, just wear your jeans, wear a t-shirt, and instead of coming out." like everybody else and doing your thing with the music and the strippers and the big, big, big. I said, just come down through the crowd. Be one of those people. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to get over with those people, convince them that you're one of them. That's how you get over. And he lost the cigars. He lost the bling. He left the strippers at the club, he, you know, because he would come out with strippers all the time. <laughs> you know, the Diamond Dolls, you know, remember the Diamond Dolls? Those are like five dollar lap dance dancers in Atlanta, man. Wow. <laughs> I thought they was like like real, you know. Oh no, they were five dollar lap dance dancers. <laughs> oh my god, my god. In Atlanta. That was his gimmick, though, oh. and he lost all of it. He started coming down through the crowd, and he just embraced that. And what he did is he embraced being himself mm -hmm. instead of trying to be somebody else. He was just himself, and the audience loved it. And he got over like crazy, and he worked his ass off, and he became a good actor. He became a good performer, and he became an amazing wrestler because he's just that guy. He's committed. But he also got there because he was comfortable being himself. And Bill Goldberg is another guy. You know, he came along. He had like 15 minutes worth of training, and he became a superstar. Yeah. You know? But he didn't have to be somebody else. He was comfortable being Bill Goldberg, mm -hmm. and he connected with the audience. Yeah, I would I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when um, DDP had to tell those strippers like I can't, I can't use you no more. <laughs> Here's five dollars. Get the fuck out of here. See you after the show. Hey, Bishop said that the girls got to go. I'll bring some of the boys down. We'll make it up to you. <laughs> God. Yeah, he did tell us one time that you told him you're like, yo, lose a cigar. He's like. Eric, that's all I got left is a cigar. Because you already had made him lose everything else. And he's like, it is what it is. When Eric says lose a cigar, you lose a cigar. But it worked. Yeah. 
bad. No, I mean, he was a he was a, a, a legend at the time. Everybody loved him. And especially when he had that year, I think it was 95, 96, right? Wrestler of the Year or whatnot. And everybody was just and, you obsessed know, with the way he was portraying his character. And he and I think part of the reason is everybody knew he was really putting in the work. Mm-hmm. I mean, he didn't really start learning how to become a professional wrestler until he was in his 30s. Mm-hmm. That's usually when you're thinking about winding down your career in, in the ring. Well, you should be. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, a lot of people would say that the mentality of the superstars, like that's a lot of ego in one place. Like NWO, for example, they were all superstars. How was the behind the scenes of working with those guys together? Was it easy to get these storylines done? Was it hard? Did they did they have a lot of issues with Macho at the time? Or like kind of break that down to me. It was easy in the beginning because in the beginning it just worked so well. And you have to remember a lot of those guys, you know, a lot of the guys in WCW at the time that were working for me had been a part of the WWF when it was at its peak. Mm. And they missed that. And they came to WCW and we weren't anywhere near the where they had been in WWF. But with the NWO and Hulk Hogan turning, all of a sudden, we're number one, right? And for a period of time, everybody got along great. Ideas flowed very easily. There was this kind of collaborative vibe going on, you know. But egos, talent, athletes, people that have competed their whole life, they get bored fast. And they got real used to the success they were having. So that's when it started getting a little more political. And guys would try to manipulate to get what they wanted. So the, the, the collaborative vibe didn't last but three or four or five months. And then it got to be difficult because you got strong personalities. Kevin Nash was a strong personality. Scott Hall, strong personality. Um, Hulk could be unbearably stubborn at times. <laughs> But he had a right yeah. to be. You know? But did those three work well together? Or did they, they have a lot of riff behind the scenes? No, I think in the beginning, they, you know, Hulk was smart enough to look at Scott especially because Scott was the cool one. Kevin got a lot of the cool vibe from Scott. Kevin, Kevin's his own person. and He's got his own kind of cool factor going on. But Scott was the guy. And Hulk was smart enough to know that his red and yellow ass is going to have to learn how to... <laughs> To, to, to cool up just a little bit if this is going to work. So he leaned on Scott a lot just to help develop his character, Hulk's character. Um, and in the beginning, like I said, it was really easy. But it, it, you know, throw a little bit of alcohol in there, throw some bad personal decisions in there, and before you know it, yeah. you've got, you know, a bunch of guys with big personalities not necessarily getting along too well all the time. Yeah, I've heard some behind-the-scenes stories of um, Scott and Mark and Hulk like partying at hotels, those three together, and they would just like take over a hotel. Those three guys, they'd say who could come in, who could go out, and they would just tear apart these hotel lobby bars. Is that true? Uh, I never saw that. Yeah. You know, when I was, of course, I was the boss. So how much are they going to, you know, yeah. you're going to show your yeah. ass. You're not going to do it when the boss is down the bar having a beer with you, you know? So I didn't see a lot of that. You know, what I saw guys together at a bar, it was pretty calm. Yeah. It was fun. It was, yeah. So they weren't as wild as people think they were behind the scenes? Not in front of him. Not in front of yeah. me. And and the ones that were were not really the the Hulks and the Randys. You know, those guys are too smart for that. Who they, were the wildest ones? Usually the guys that you never really hear too much about. Got it. You know, yeah. they were the ones that would lose their yeah. shit. But at the time, NWO, when you would travel, they would still, off scenes, like off camera, they would move as a team, those guys? No. Oh, no. No. I always wondered if they were really always together, always traveling, always working on a character, because they look like the best group of friends on TV growing yeah, up. Yeah, no, and, and, and quite the opposite, really. You know, Hulk didn't really so... No, they were friends, don't get me wrong. And they would talk to each other on the phone, maybe run ideas, you know, past each other during the week on the phone, but they didn't really hang out. R- Randy and Hulk did, depending on where they were in their relationship at the time. They hung out quite a bit together. They worked out. I would go down to do business with them and end up, Go to the half the time I did business with them, I had to go to the gym to do it. Mm. You know, and they all worked out every day or what? Yeah, pretty much every day. You, you've, you've never really enjoyed life until you've worked out on a Monday morning with Brian Nobbs, one of the nasty boys. <laughs> you you ever remember Brian? I remember, yeah. I remember, yeah, he's loud and obnoxious and, in the gym and fun, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the roster of talent that you got to work with Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Lex Luger, Sting, Ric Flair, Goldberg, Bret Hart. The Big Show, Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page, 
when I when I list those names, it's probably the twelve most iconic names you can list besides the Undertaker and Stone Colds and Rocks. Mm -hmm. Which one of those guys were your favorite to work with? Mm, it would be you know it's, it's different. I, I Scott Hall, like when he was sober. Because you know Scott had a problem, everybody knows it. But when he was clear-headed, he was one of the most creative, interesting people I've ever talked with. He was really, really smart about human psychology, and he's street smart. He's not a college-educated guy, but his basic understanding of human psychology and how to use it in order to tell a story or create a character for wrestling was fascinating to me. Mm. He created the Sting character. The Crow guy, you know, when Sting turned yeah. Crow, he went from the surfer looking painted face and all that. Yeah. And then he went into that Crow character. That was Scott Hall's idea. Wow. I was sitting in a locker room one day. I'll tell you how this story came about. The Crow character. We're sitting in the locker room. It's me, Kevin, Scott, Hulk, maybe one or two other people. I don't remember. And we're just sitting around shooting the shit a couple hours before the show. And Sting was kind of interested in changing his character. He wasn't c comfortable with the flat top, bleach blonde, painted face thing. He just he didn't know what to do. So we're all just shooting the shit. And Scott goes, you know what you should do? Because you ever see the movie The Crow? And he just starts describing Brandon Lee's character in that movie. And Scott's walking us through all the different ways that we could use this character. He's, you're just like the spooky guy, bro. You're just hanging up in the rafters. You don't ever say anything. You're just always there watching over everything. It's a mystery, right? He's, Scott's painting this amazing picture of this character and how to use the character. And I looked over at Sting, and his eyes are about this freaking big, man. He was all excited. He just couldn't wait. And we pulled the trigger and did it. And that's how that Sting character evolved because of Scott Hall. So for the reason that I said, when you find somebody that is so passionate and has such a good handle on storytelling, mm -hmm. they're fun to work with. Mm. Did you ever work with the, um, the the Steiner brothers? Oh, yeah. I love those guys. Man. Oh, yeah. Robbie, Rick Steiner and I are they're still good friends to this day. We went up into, God, we went up into the, uh, the Yukon hunting elk together, or elk and moose. That was fun. <laughs> But yeah, Steiner Brothers are great. Yeah. So, well, Rick, Scott, I could, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I could take him or leave him, but Rick is great. When when people talk about character development, especially in wrestling, you know, like Rampage, you're larger than life in real life and on the camera when you were fighting, when you were not fighting. Like that character is you. Like it's not, Rampage is not an act, right? Some of these guys, they have to portray someone maybe they're not in real life or they're battling depression or, you know, being alcoholic or whatnot. And they have to, turn that off and then give America a great character and make people fall in love with them. One thing though, is you were the first to kind of play this heel general manager that, you know, takes on the whole world and kind of gets the audience to rally against you and allows the wrestlers to kind of rally through that. It kind of like a, you know, you position yourself well, kind of like the coach in Miracle where he wanted the whole team to hate one guy so then they can have a central goal to beat, you know, the team they're competing against. At what point do you feel Vince McMahon looked at that and said, this is what I got to do or else I'm going to fall behind. Oh, I, it had to be, I can tell you probably what month it was. It probably was sometime in the summer of 97 because we were just stomping a mud hole in them, as they like to say <laughs> in the South, kind of embarrassing them so badly each and every week. And Vince is a very competitive person. I mean, very competitive, psycho competitive. <laughs> so you you have to know how much that bothered him. Yeah. Mm. To have someone like me who had just kind of walked on <laughs> and just bitch slap him every week for two years. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you never worked with him before that, huh? No. No. So it, it, it got real. And yeah. It, it got fun. I loved it. But the character, here's what I did. I played myself. You know, I was on camera. I was an announcer, so people were used to seeing me on camera. It's not like I came out from, you know, nah. the office building. but So they were used to seeing me as a character anyway, but I was like the weatherman. You know, I didn't really have a personality. My job was just to give information. So for me, turning heel was really just taking who I really am and turning up the volume on some aspects of it because I can really be an ass. And, and I can really, I have fun sometimes 
manipulating people into situations they either want to be in or don't want to be in. So I just turn the volume up on some of that stuff. I mean, one of the things that I want to know is true or false that you would go on air because you were alive. You would tell everybody what happened in WWE so oh, yeah. they wouldn't watch that and then they would watch you. Is that true? Absolutely. So true. that's why Vince hated you. No. Not, not <laughs> only, so not only would I do that, I, would, I went to my network president, Brad Siegel, and I said, Brad, their show comes on at 8 o'clock. My show comes on at 8 o'clock. I want to come on at 7.58. So that when people tune into me, they know I can give them all of the information about what's going to happen in WWE before it even comes on the air. Well, and I did that. Smart. That is the craziest tool. And do you think that that helped the audience fall in love with you more as well, personally? Because they're like, it, it was, this guy's giving us the juice. It was a love-hate thing because, you know, I was turning the tradition of professional wrestling completely upside down, shaking it out and throwing out the parts I didn't want and putting new parts in. And people hate that. Nobody likes change. Yeah. And I was coming, and they were number one. Like I was a distant number two. It would it would be like me picking a fight with Rampage. People look at that and go, what the hell are you doing that for? You know? And it, but it's also what got people interested because it was kind of crazy. And it got people to tune in to see what kind of silly shit I would do next. And I just kept doing more and more silly shit. Yeah. I mean, at one point, I believe it's, uh, I think it was uh, Bret Hart loses a match to Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels then become, I think that was called the, what is the the screw job, right? The Montreal screw job. The Montreal right. screw job. And then, you know, Shawn Michaels becomes a face at WWE. And then at this point, they're trying to figure out what to do. They need a new face, right? They got to go against you. I'm believing this is around the right time. Something around that, mm -hmm. that era. At what point did Vince McMahon then hit you up to then come in and be a character on WWE because mm. then you end up, I remember videos of you kind of going against uh, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin and he's yelling at you and Vince is in the ring and you're fighting Vince. And I'm like, this is crazy. I used to watch this guy in WCW. Yeah. Well, about 1999, I got fired. No, I still had two and a half years left on my contract. So when I say I got fired, I just jumped on my plane and went fishing. You know, it was no big deal. Uh, I wasn't too worried about my next job at that point. Mm. But I, I left in 99. Um, they realized a couple months after they sent me home that they probably screwed up. So they offered to bring me back, but I had a really good agent here in LA at the time. And uh, I said, okay, here's the deal. You got to pay me out hundred percent on the contract that I already have. And then you're going to write me a new contract. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I want a three movie deal in that package so that not only am I going to come to work, and by the way, I will, I'm not going to be an employee. I'm going to be a consultant, an independent contractor. I'll oversee the creative, but I don't want to manage anybody. I don't want to have to come to anybody's office. I'm not doing any of that stuff. And I want you to guarantee me that you're going to buy three movies from me. Now, I had no intention of being a movie guy, but I knew if I had that commitment from Turner Broadcasting, I could leverage that here in town mm -hmm. and end up being involved in the movie business, even though I didn't know anything about it. So I got that deal and I was there for about a, know, two or three months and then it just got worse. So they sent me home again and it was shortly after that. And then fast forward, w WWE buys WCW. Yeah. Um, and it was about a year after they bought WCW that I got a phone call from Vince. I was sitting, in my, I lived in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was sitting out in my office, I had a casita out there separate in my office and I get a phone call and said, hey pal, <laughs> Vince McMahon here. We talked for about three minutes. I knew I was gonna come back and just did. But during that time, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't you go back and try to buy WCW and all the footage, but then oh, yeah. you would have nothing to do with it and then Vince heard that and kind of bought you out? Well, and he didn't buy me out. Well, I put together a deal yeah. with a with a, a couple of guys that were very, very successful on Wall Street. Um, we raised $67 million to purchase WCW from Turner Broadcasting. That deal was announced. Uh, my, my partners in that deal were pretty high profile uh, venture capitalists. So we did a Wall Street, you know, dog and pony show and announced the sale of, of, of WCW to my group. Uh, the group that I was a part of and uh, everything was going fine. We we're doing all the due diligence, going through contracts, making sure everything was in order. And at the very last minute, we got a phone call and said, no, deal's off the table. They're taking it off the table. They don't want to sell to you. Wow. And that's when Vince swooped in and bought it. It's nothing illegal about that. 
Maybe an ethical. Denial. Yeah, I, I, not not le- not illegal, but there's probably you could have probably sued for civil damages and interference and all kinds of litigation, but nobody was interested in that at the time. I mean, love him or hate him, Vince McMahon is probably one of the greatest like business executives to orchestrate kind of a business. You know, I don't know about oh, outside a, of that, but he's, he's a, a monster mercenary. In, the, in the boardroom. Yeah. He's just a mercenary. Dana White talks about that you know even with the tko holdings with when ufc and wwe merged and you think vince mcmahon had a lot to do with that i think vince mcmahon's the 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 puppet man that guy controls all the strings for every deal what what people don't understand about vince mcmahon and we're sitting here with a legend who probably could explain it better than me is the longevity play it's like a bezos they're not worried about today or tomorrow they're worrying about a trajectory of where the business is going to go and how it gets there and so they can step over a lot of people on the way It's there. vision, right? Yeah. They see things out into the future so much differently than the average person. Yeah. Average, Even average or really good business person often don't have the kind of vision, a Dana White or a Vince McMahon, a Ted Turner. These people see things differently than we do. Yeah. Hmm. What What is up with the rumor that you guys were killing it, you guys were going to keep killing it, and then the WWE came in, maybe paid some people at the – at the uh, broadcasting company to kind of steal the time. Is that true? Something of this nature? They they came in and bought out a contract so that way you wouldn't be able to have that or they paid someone on the side not to give you guys air time. Yeah. yeah, there's a guy in, involved in all this by the name of Stu Snyder. He was, uh, there was a, a- And if I'm saying it wrong, please correct me. Yeah. No, but it's a murky story, yeah, yeah. but there's some truth to it. You know, when there's smoke, there's a fire in there somewhere. A little smoke, a little fire, Rampage. But when it, there was a- uh, Rock did a documentary, Who Killed WCW? Right? I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. Yeah, no, I didn't he, see it. Rock produced it. It was out uh, maybe six, eight months ago, a year ago. Anyway, there was an interview in there with a guy by the name of Stu Snyder who just ironically happened to work for Turner, knew a lot of the key executives in Turner, went to work for Vince McMahon, and all of a sudden they found a way to buy WCW out from underneath my group. Now, I don't don't know. There's no facts that you can point to, but I know stink when I smell it. (laughs) (laughs) It just just smelled bad. What did he do with WCW as he purchased it? You know, really nothing. Um, The library, he's monetized, he's made a lot of money off that library. And it was a really important thing because Vince, you know, years ago decided he was going to be one of the very first people in the entertainment industry as a producer to invest fully in the -the over-the-top kind of content distribution strategy. He walked away from pay-per-view as we know it, put all of his eggs in that basket, and now, you know, look what streaming's become. So it was, again, another one of those moves, four steps ahead of everybody else, makes him look like he had a crystal ball, but that's just the way they think. What what was the relationship with you and, like, Stone Cold and dealing with those guys when you were dealing with Vince when you came to work with the WWE? Steve, Steve had his own issues with Vince, uh, I don't think there's a lot of trust there at, 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 during certain points, but I also think Steve respected Vince because of what Vince was able to accomplish. And quite honestly, where Steve was, Steve was and is still one of the most incredibly successful in the history of the business over the last 30 years. But it was, again, kind of a love-hate thing. I had my own issues with Steve. I fired Steve. Last time I had seen Steve was when I fired him in WCW, and I, I didn't even fire him in person. I just sent him a FedEx <laughs> you fired Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. Wow. wow. That was probably maybe a mistake on that one, huh? No. No? No. I did his podcast a couple years ago, and even Steve, we recounted the story because we were both drinking heavily at the time, of course. <laughs> I was at Steve's house, and was like, I think we went through two cases of beer on the first podcast, and we shot another one the next day. <laughs> but Steve, Steve had issues at the time. He was injury prone. He had a lot of uh, knee injuries. And... We had Steve scheduled to come in to, uh, to do a TV taping. And I just, he was hurt. He couldn't wrestle. But I wanted to keep him out in front of the public's eye. I didn't want him to just disappear because the audience could forget about you for a while if you do that. So I, I had Tony Schiavone, one of my announcers and producers, say, I said, hey, Tony, give Steve a call because he lived in Atlanta. That's where we were shooting. I said, have him come on down to the building. We're just going to shoot a quick two or three minute promo with him, you know, backstage. Make sure everybody knows he's still alive. Tony goes to call Steve. Steve's wife picks up the phone. Tony relayed this to me. Tony says, yeah, I'd like to speak to Steve. Tony, Steve's wife said, hey, Steve, Tony's on the phone. He wants to talk to you. And Tony comes back to me and says, yeah, and I could hear Steve in the background saying, 
tell them sons of bitches to kiss my ass. <laughs> and, and Steve's wife said, he can't come to the phone right now. <laughs> so Tony comes back and tells me, I said, where's Steve? We need him. We're going to shoot this stuff. I got people waiting. He goes, no. He told me what happened. He stooged him out. I said, okay, that's no problem. No problem. We'll go take, we'll do, we'll do something else tonight. And I got to the office the next day and told my attorney to drop a notice and let him know he was fired. Wow. Damn. And, so and, cold and, we, and we stuck it in the mail and I sent it to him FedEx. That's how he found out. All right. Have you ever gotten a fight with one of the wrestlers? No. No. I Probably there was quite a few that wanted to, but <laughs> was there they a wanted their check more. <laughs> <laughs> was there a wrestler you didn't get along with? Not really. I mean, there's some that I chose not to be around, just you know, but that's human nature. There's people that, are, for no reason, I just don't like hanging around with them. Bad energy or whatever. There was some of that, but for the most part, I get along with everybody pretty good. I remember the match where uh, Stone Cold is holding you kind of in the corner, and Steve's, you know, or and, uh, Vince McMahon is kind of like battling it out with you, and then you you kick him, and Vince McMahon's wearing that Rocky Balboa cotton, you know, boxer Brooklyn outfit. Yeah. Did you really kick him as hard as you could? No. Because one of the scenes says that when uh, Vince McMahon came backstage, he went up to you and he said, hey, next time don't actually kick me in the face. Is that true? No. All right. No. He wouldn't. First of all, he would never do that. Really? No. He would never admit that. There's no way he would ever, in the wrestling business, they call it selling. I don't know what it's called in MMA. But if you, you get hit in the face, you don't want to let somebody know it's bothering you, right? <laughs> Vince is like that in real life times 10. He mm. will never sell anything to anybody. He'll never let you know that you're getting to him. Physically, emotionally. Yeah. Anyway, it's just not him. But did, was he good at wrestling? Like physically wrestling? He was tough. I mean, he's physically tough. Yeah. And, and crazy. I don't know. Technically, was he that good? Yeah. Probably not. But it didn't matter because of the type of character he was. He didn't have to be good. He just had to be mean. Yeah. So so what ends up happening? You leave. You go do a best-selling book. You become like a New York Times best-selling author or whatnot. And then you come back again. For a second round? In 2019, they brought me in, but more uh, on the creative side of the business. I was hired to be essentially the showrunner for SmackDown on Fox. Just oversee yeah. most of it. Um, but that didn't work. Why not? From my perspective, I just didn't have the ability to adapt to that culture. It, I know this sounds you know, stupid in a way, but I live... I live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and I like it because there's nobody around me. I, I, I was into social distancing before it became a thing. That's why I moved to Wyoming, because I generally don't like being around large groups of people. And I had to move to Stanford, freaking Connecticut. Back up. I live in a 5,000 square foot house on 20 acres right outside of Yellowstone National Park. I can literally see it from my deck like Sarah Palin can see Russia. I can see Yellowstone. <laughs> so to go from that to a two-bedroom corporate apartment in downtown Stanford had a much bigger effect on me than I thought I would. It just, I, I was always uncomfortable there. Now I got to go to work and I'm working directly face-to-face -face with Vince almost every day. And sometimes for six, four, six, eight hours at a stretch, going until three or four o'clock in the morning. So if you don't really have good chemistry with someone that you're working with like that, if it's bad chemistry, you're just not feeling the vibe, it's brutal. Oh, yeah. It just didn't work for me. And, you know, I can't do my best work in an environment like that. I just can't. I don't want to. So it, and that was my fault. He, I was given the opportunity. I could have... I could still be there if I would have chosen to adapt. But I've just gotten to the point in my life where it's like, eh, fuck it, I don't want to adapt that much. <laughs> I'll adapt a little bit, yeah. but not that much. Do you still love wrestling? Yeah, I miss parts of it. What do you miss? I miss the collaborative, creative part of it. I love creating characters. I love bringing stories to life. And that's, that's the only part I miss. I hate traveling. I just despise it. So I don't miss that part. I don't miss having people's careers in my hands. Mm. That sounds like a cool thing. Like you, you manage all these talents and yeah, but they got wives, they've got kids, they got bills, they got issues. And sometimes you, you know, you've got to make decisions that affect people's lives. I don't ever want to be in that position again. Uh, let's create a character for Bear right now. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what you he, got me? I, I would see him as Gold Dust partner. 
Mm -hmm. The one, that, the, you know, when he never you talks thinking? about, you know, the, you is know. that what you were thinking? Yeah, you can't like gold dust. That that's what you're thinking. We call you gay dust. <laughs> That would be exciting. Yeah. That means happy, right? Gay means happy. To be happy. Is exactly. Joyful. So I'm just like a happy dust guy. Yeah. Happy and dusty. That's incredible, brother. Yeah. I that'd, be a good, that'd be a good character for Honestly, you. Honestly, bro, if the, the fact wrestler. that you're thinking of me like that makes me feel incredible about you. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go, try and turn it around on yeah. me. Yeah. Incredible. You always wanted to be a pro wrestler. I think that'd be a good stick. Now would be a perfect time to up your dosage of Ozempic. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Play with my name like that again. I'm a happy dust guy. Cool. What what are and I, first of all, I appreciate you coming on this podcast and giving us all the behind the scenes. This is uh I've been telling Rampage, I've been super excited for this one because I grew up loving wrestling. I had a couple cousins, uh, my cousins Maria and Giancarlo, and they used to make me watch wrestling all day long. And you f you fall in love with these characters, right? And at the mm -hmm. time, there's no social media. So I would go to school thinking Stone Cold Steve Austin was the baddest dude on the planet. You know, I'd go to school and I'd think, man, Undertaker might be underneath my bed tonight. Like, that dude is scary, <laughs> right? And then we come into this day and age where you see social media kind of adapting. And, you know, a lot of these characters become a little bit more not so ambiguous and you kind of know who they are and then you see them on social and maybe their socials aren't ran the same way. So we see the, the narrative pro wrestling. Now you have like the Logan Pauls and these very um, colorful characters, right? And they're all doing fantastic. It's just a different age, but that attitude era, the WCW, these tough guys, we don't see that anymore. Is there anything from that era or anything from the, the way you guys built characters you feel adapted or MMA could use in today's time to build characters faster? You know, it's really funny. Um, I've been to a couple um, bare knuckle fighting championship fights, mm. and I, I'm impressed. I mean, I love I love MMA in general. I love I love boxing. I love contact sports. There's nothing like it. Amateur wrestling. There's really nothing like it. You know, you're out there just it's just you and your opponent, and you're out there in your underwear, and <laughs> you're just digging in. It's and you can't blame anybody else. It's all on you. You win, you won. You lose, you lost. Not the team, not the coach. It is what it is. I love that. Um, but I think the stories, like I, I can't imagine ever being a wrestling type story in MMA because it would lose its credibility. But there are so many fascinating stories that are real stories about the fighters and, and how they ended up, where they ended up, that I think you can bring those stories to life in a much better way. I don't think we spend enough time getting to know the fighters. We get to know the shit talk. We get to see what happens at the way in. That's all the, the sizzle that they put on the stake in order to get your attention. But there's some really fascinating stories with any athlete. And I think bringing those, you know, perfect example. Do you ever watch The Voice? Yeah. My daughter's got a friend, it's one of the backup singers on, on The Voice. We ended up watching a lot of it. And the way that they bring those competitors, the singers, they, they go to their hometown, they interview their mothers, they interview their high school teachers, they, you know, the, their boyfriends, their girlfriends, whatever, the dog catcher, whoever's got a story and you get to know these people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a crazy story, but when you get to know a fighter, one way or the other, you're going to be interested in watching what happens with that fighter. I'd like to see more of that. I'm glad, I'm glad he said that. Yeah? Yeah. Why is that? Because um, you know I'm starting my own amateur MMA league, mm. and that's one thing that I decided to do different mm. uh, from the other M amateur MMA leagues. And I want to get these amateurs ready for the pros. And I think people should, because you know amateurs, they still got to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you go you see what they do for a living, and you go see their friends, their family, and figure out why they want to become a, a, a MMA fighter. Mm -hmm. And when, when the audience knows what motivates them and, and it, they know that they have to work at UPS from, you know, three to 11, you know, and then come home and train and hopefully sleep for two hours and, you know, play with a kid before he goes to school and then off and go do it again five or six days a week. You can, if you hear that story, you'll relate to that person. You'll root for that person. You'll want to see that person win. And I think teaching them, teaching young aspiring fighters how to sell a fight mm -hmm. You may, you may or may not be able to teach them how to win a fight, but if you can teach them how to sell a fight, they'll make money. Mm -hmm. They'll stay busy, even if they're not the best fighters in the world. If they learn how to sell the, their fights, promoters will want to book them. Right. I think that's lost uh, in the new uh, MMA. Like A lot of fighters, they don't know how to sell a fight. Well, it's like what he's saying, too. One thing I never understood is like you guys had the same kind of cast of characters every Monday, and plus or minus a few guys in the matches. 
MMA, UFC, we used to fall in love with these fighters because we watched them fight two or three times a year and it was the same crew and we could follow them through the highs and lows. Now there's a fight every Friday and every Friday it's a completely new batch of 30 to 40 fighters. It's so hard to keep up with that. And you don't know anything about them. And and they dress the same. They don't have their own like identity. Why why are you always worried about what a dude dresses like? That's crazy to me, dog. You got to stop. You a legend and you you a champion. You don't got to worry about what people are dressing like. If that's what you're into, brother. Keep that off the podcast. One, one reason why <laughs> one reason why Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell was uh, such icons is because of their their outfits and you know pro wrestling. Is that is a hot take. Thing. I like that take. It's yeah. because of flames and the blue. Yeah, but look, you made you, that's a great another great point. That's wrestling. You made them iconic because of their outfit, the attitude, the personality, the language. That all goes together. That makes the character. Now you guys all wear Venom shorts. It's got snake print. It looks like they should be Goldust's partner. And <laughs> at the same time, they're always wearing either green or blue. Like, I love the fact that you were the only guy that wore camo pants. I, I still dress up as Macho Man Randy Savage every year for Halloween. I got the things. Elizabeth, though, I love that. Like, but we don't have that anymore. Yeah, we don't have that anymore. We don't have personality. We don't have individualism. And, and you do have to. I mean, it's a business. It's the fight business. It's still the business. And you have to make a living doing it. And in order to do that in any business, you have to stand out. You have to remember that logo, Jackson mm-hmm. with two X's. I'll never forget that. You know, you Amen. Have, black, Amen. Black and white logos, you know, bold print. It's an easy, it's an easy thing to identify. But you need to do that as a fighter too. Branding it's a brand. expert. Branding expert 101. I watched your TED talk and I love the way you came on stage. You just start calling everybody out. This town sucks. You suck. I'll fight you in the audience. <laughs> if anybody out there wants to watch one of the funniest TED Talks of all time, watch the first four minutes of this guy's TED Talk. I don't know where you were, but you're like, I'm in a crappy town. I don't know you why you're looking at me like that. I'll fight you right now. I thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing I ever watched in my life. Yeah, can I tell you a story about yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. So I get this phone call from the guy that's producing this TED Talk. It's in <laughs> Naperville, uh, Illinois, south of Chicago. And it's a very affluent, kind of ridiculous place, right? Mm-hmm. Affluent means like a rich neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, thank and, you for bringing uh, that down. <laughs> and I was kind of excited to do it because it was a challenge. I'd never done anything like that before. You're supposed to hit like 11 minutes or 14 minutes or whatever it was. They give you an allotted time. I looked at it as like a really cool challenge. So I spent like months working on my TED Talk. And I was working with the promoter, you know, who wanted to know everything I was going to do and say, right? But had his little inputs here and there. Fine. So I'm I'm prepared. Jump on a plane. I fly to Chicago. I take the latest flight out I could get because I'm just a bitch that way. <laughs> and I fell asleep on a plane. I had my iPad sitting in front of me because that's where I had my speech, right, or my talk. I had my iPad. I took, I fell asleep. Stewart's flight attendant. Sorry. I'm get yelled at for that. Flight attendant comes by, wakes me up. Oh, what the hell? I get up, walk off the plane. I left my iPad. <laughs> I didn't even remember, I didn't even realize it until the next morning when I got up. I go, okay, I better work on my talk, and get get ready, right? So I get a pot of coffee, I go to look for my iPad, and it's gone. I don't have one. And I couldn't, I didn't have it memorized, really. So I was like, oh, now what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm just going to wing it. So I came up with the idea of bringing politics and wrestling together. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. basically something yeah. like politics has become more like professional wrestling than professional wrestling has. It's all like work. And uh, I went up to the promoter that morning because I think we started at 11. I said, look, I lost my talk. I know you probably have a copy of it, but I'm going to go do something else. I said, now, that being said, the first couple minutes are going to get awkward. Don't worry about it. It'll end up okay, but don't come out and try to pull me off the stage (laughs) because it's good. You're going to be tempted. I promise. And he was like, oh my God, these are all pretty stiff people. Yeah. They're just. Did they buy into this? Academic types. Did they buy into it? Yeah. Yeah. There was, you know, first it was was like nervous laughter. I came out and started offending everybody. What do you people look at? pretty good. What am I doing in this shithole? (laughs) But it's, you know, it's like this beautiful venue, right? What are you looking at? Uh, I know what you're looking at, lady. Ain't happening here. Wow. Lose a little weight. Maybe next time. Yeah, oh, yeah. he went in. He went in. And it went from uncomfortable, oh, he's trying to be funny, to motherfucker. <laughs> there were people there getting angry. And then I, I let him know what I was doing. And 
segued into the talk, but it was pretty fun. It was different. I might use that one uh, next time I have to do a, like a boardroom speech. I'm gonna walk in and call out all the CEOs for being yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to break, guys. Yeah. I, I got like one more thing for you before I let you go. And, and I know Rampage has something he probably wants to talk about. Um, Rampage had a, uh, he wanted to know how he could fit into those dresses that Elizabeth used to wear. <laughs> but uh, one, <laughs> you're gonna get it for the next three weeks, brother, for embarrassing me in front of the GOAT. One thing I wanted to know is going into this documentary that came out and like the WCW one, the Vince McMahon one, and we saw you in a documentary as well. And people could go watch these. They're out on Netflix and all over the place. Is there anything in these documentaries that have been coming out the last couple of months you feel they left out that is like good meat and potatoes about you or what you've done and accomplished? No, I think it's been, you know, Rock did a really good, Dwayne Johnson mm -hmm. and his production company, Seven Bucks, along with Brian Gewertz. Uh, they did a really good job, I think, of telling the world what really happened with WCW and and seeing information for the very first time that had a lot to do with it that had never been revealed before. Interviews with certain people that nobody's ever heard of before that were really an important part of it all. That part of it, I think, has been covered really well. Mm -hmm. Up until The Rock's version of what happened to WCW, um, the story was pretty murky because there were just too many people that didn't really know what they were talking about telling that story. But Rock's team did a really good job. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was these two wrestlers, Bret Hart and The Big Show. What mm -hmm. was it like working with them? And any behind the scenes stories that we don't know about? Because we heard on the internet, and we asked our Jackson Podcast Discord what they want to know. And they said that you have some interesting stories they've seen on the internet of you talking about these two wrestlers. You know, not really so much with Big Show. He was new. He was brand new to the business. He'd only been in it for a very brief period of time. Hulk Hogan kind of took him under his wing, protected him quite a bit. And, and and got Paul really to the to the top of the business in very short order, but I always get along well with Paul. I mean, he really is a gentle giant. You know, he's quite capable of doing severe damage, and he knows it. And and I think he compensates that compensates for that by being about as gentle of a human being as I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. um, Brett, you know, it's unfortunate. I really the first time I met Brett, I think it was ninety six. I really got along with him well. We're very similar. You know, he kind of likes living off by himself a little bit. He loves the outdoors. He loves history. Native American history is something that we both have in common. We both have a strong interest in that. Um, but Brett came to WCW under duress. Mm. You know, it was right after the Montreal screw job. Brett took that a little too hard. He really believed he was a Canadian hero. And it, it it really took a lot out of him emotionally. So when he got to WCW, he was a, I don't want to say a shell, but he, he wasn't the same guy that he was in WWE. Mm. He was broken. Mm. And then shortly after that, his brother got killed in a ring, and he never recovered from that. So I, I would have liked to work with Brett earlier in his career. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been fun because I really respect what he's capable of doing in the ring. But he's, he's a little bitter, and I think broken at this point yeah is he still involved in wrestling at all no 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 he suffered a concussion at uh, bill goldberg he was in a match with bill goldberg and brett of course blames bill for it i'm not so sure that's how it happened but it was a career-ending concussion he had wow. a stroke shortly thereafter oh wow so yeah i don't i don't think he could even get in the ring Damn, I mean, it? not to wrestle. I mean, yeah, he, yeah. He wouldn't, I'm telling you things. If you saw him, he would never notice this. But, yeah. you know, I think the stroke took a little out of him. <clears throat> and then, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't think people understand how dangerous pro wrestling is. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, when you see it, it's like being like a live stuntman. You got to be you a great athlete. It? When you did it, did you enjoy it? I, I liked it. I always wanted, but I didn't get a chance to do much. Well, and someone like you that's coming in, especially from, you know, your profession, if you're coming in as a wrestling character, you're gonna they're gonna lean into that aspect of your athleticism, right? They're not gonna ask you to do backflips off the top rope. Right. That would be stupid and wouldn't be consistent with your character. Right. Let other people do that. But it's it is dangerous. It, you know, people have died. You know, I mentioned, you know, Owen Hart as an example. Mark Bagwell, who worked for me in WCW, uh, broke his neck. Uh, in, in a match, and we thought he was going to be paralyzed from the neck down. He came back. He came out of it, but there was a couple days there when we weren't sure. It can happen, you know. As a fighter, you know, you know, you're protecting yourself at all. You're protecting yourself at all times. As a wrestler, you're counting on your opponent to protect you, mm -hmm. and that's a little scary until okay. you get used to it. 
Did you have any training for being a wrestler? No, you know, they 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 put a ring in my gym. I had my own gym back in the day and 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 they never sent me they never sent anyone over there to train me. I was very excited about it. What what was that lady name that was running the TNA when I was there? I forgot her name. Dixie Carter. Oh yeah, Dixie Carter. I just I just feel like she she dropped the ball, you know, cuz um they had me stare down Kurt Angle and at that time that picture went viral on the internet. Cuz that would have been a hell of a matchup. And you guys could have had a hell of a match. Because you wouldn't have had to rely on the silly wrestling stuff, you know, the over the top jumping off rope stuff. You guys could have just gone. Yeah, I was surprised at how the internet loved it. It went viral. You should try it. You should get back at next. I'm too old now. I got too many injuries and stuff for wrestling. After for, me, for you wrestling. put on a show for Ray Mysterio. Oh, you, you, you a lightweight. You nothing. I'm a what? You a lightweight. I'm a what? You a lightweight. You not, you a peon. In front of the goat, you're gonna say that? I'm just keeping it real. He you said, really hey, think I'm a lightweight. Hey, hey, he you really think real. I'm a lightweight. You're lightweight, bro. You not you 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 like psst. I can just I can just flick you. You like a booger. You I'm know, sorry you. I'm not shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're nothing. You see what buddy. I gotta do with? You see what I gotta do? I'm sorry I'm not shaped like a cinnamon, brother. I'm over here trying to get in my physique. Summer's coming up. I know well, you're in well, winter, you're so you're on steroids, bulking. so it's oh, easy. What? For you. you own it. In front of this guy, you're gonna say that? You own the shit. I'm not nothing. I'm just kidding. He came here. He was honest, so I might as well like. I and want, I don't judge. Yeah, so. don't, don't judge. Nothing, yeah. I have a good sleep. I eat egg whites in the morning. And that's about it. And I run every day like Rocky. Five. I miles. do carnivore. I work out two hours a day, and I'm on a strict carnivore diet. You should try that. Yeah, you, you look good. I'm yeah, you look good. How old are you? 69. Not a chance. The same age as my dad. Not a chance. You're 69. No yeah. way. I'll be 70. In you're in better shape than all of our producers, and that he's 30. He's t- how old are you? 36. What? Yeah, you're shaped like a bowling pin, bro. Yeah, yeah, you shape pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, you, hey, you need it. Yeah, yeah. This is what it looks like to be in a peak male physical form. At 69. At 69. Bear's favorite number. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not yours, because I know you don't like doing that with the opposite sex. But this is what happened. <laughs> oh, what happened? What happened? <laughs> I know you've been striking out lately. No pun intended. Mm-hmm. It's okay though, right? We'll yeah. we'll get you we'll get you gold dust. Okay. You'll be you'll be just fine. Right. Don't come for me, brother. Not in front of the goat. Today I'm ready. You gotta say no diddy after you say stuff like that. Why? I'll come all over you and I'll get you and I'll save you. Oh my God. What? <laughs> What's wrong with it? Now you see why I told you you, wanted, you should be Gold Dust partner? I always got your back, brother. No, no, come on. No, no. We got, you call me, I'm coming for you. No, no, we don't want that. Why? I would always be there for you. No, no, no. Yes, I would. No. That's what a good friend does, right? No. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> don't you got, play you with got any friends like that that want to come for you? No, if Thank you, you needed me, <laughs> Thank you. Brother, if, Thank you, you. if you needed me, I'm coming for you. In two seconds, I'm coming for you. I would be there in a heartbeat. No, no, I would okay. never let you down. All right. You're like Batman, I'm Robin. Okay. I would never let you down. All right, sounds good. Don't play with me. Don't just smile at me. You know I got your back. Mm. Hey, before I let you go, though, is it true you produced a show for Scott Bale? Scott Bale was 45 and single. That's your show? Scott Bale was 46 and pregnant. Yeah. Wait, there's two shows. Two shows. He two was pregnant? On CW, yeah. He got pregnant? Well, his wife did. Oh, wait, so you made two shows about Scott Bale? No, was it three? 45 and single, 46 and, it might have been two, two or three. Yeah, but we, 45 and single, it was about Scott trying to find love in Hollywood. <laughs> did you guys, did you see this show? I just saw a small this clip. This cat, Scott, I hope, you know, whatever. <laughs> guy's got an interesting backstory. Like, he banged Lisa Minnelli. Oh, damn. I mean, that's going back, when, yeah. like when she was hot. Yeah, I mean, he, he might have been twelve. It's crazy. I'm not really. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, Just yeah. making it up. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's got a really interesting backstory, and he, you know, he's grown through that. You know, yeah. we all did stupid shit when we were young, especially if you happen to be a big time TV star. I'm sure yeah. you did even more dumb shit. And he's settled down. He's got a beautiful wife and kids now. But he had a very interesting backstory, and we built a reality show around it. Mm. And then he got married, and his wife got pregnant. So we built a reality show around that. And then you did one about Paris Hilton? Her parents. Her parents. I want to be a Hilton. We sold that to NBC. Yeah. How'd that do? It did all right. Did you like building reality shows? No, it was no. just money. Really? Yeah. They just, just call you or is your production no, company? No, it was our production. My partner, Jason Hervey, and I had nice. a, uh, Jason was a star in the Wonder Years. Yeah. He was the butthead brother. Oh, I remember him. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. He was my partner. And we did really well out here for I don't know, about 10, 12 years. We were one of the largest suppliers of non-scripted programming, independent producers out there. But to be honest, it was just business. It was it was just transactional. Yeah. Nothing to get passionate about. What's right. your passion now? I like telling stories. I'm working uh, I'm working with an SEC whistleblower 
right now who's got an amazing Securities Exchange Commission. He's got an, ex an amazing story, and he came to me to help bring it to light. So I'm digging into that. Oh, you be careful. Yeah, that's. I don't like right. that. I don't. Yeah. You got to. You need security around you if you're gonna whistleblow about people inside. Well, I'm not training. the whistleblower. Oh. I'm just the guy he's coming to to help get some attention. Oh, okay. He's got to be careful. You got to be careful. Very careful. How would we make a show 30 and still single about Rampage? We got to make one I, of those. I, I'm not. I'm not. Or 30, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, uh, wherever you stand. I was trying to make you look good. No, no, I, That's I'm, what we need. We need a show about him being well, single. And, and you know what? As long as it's authentic, as long as it's real, you're not forcing situations, mm. I'm sure it could be an interesting story. So then we can't say that he's chasing girls around town. We got to say he's chasing guys around town so it's authentic and real and people believe it. That makes sense <laughs> at this point. Wow. wow, wow. <laughs> Why you, hey, but why are you trying to do me dirty? Because like, I was your, so excited, and you lead today your jokes with you, me being gold do you, dust. How do, you, how do you guys not get, like, deep platform for some of this shit? That's crazy. Awesome. Wow. wow. We just say everything. We're not saying anything bad. No, no, we're not saying anything We just bad. tease each other. It's, no. like, it's like my little bro. Yeah. yeah. Wait, I'm older than you. No, you're not. Do, you don't even remember that one of the years, do you? Do you? Oh, yeah. I remember Wonder Bread in Talladega Nights. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He had not seen Wonder uh, Years. I know exactly, don't, don't I know exactly what you're talking about when you said. What's the Wonder Years about? It's a TV show. About what? About the Wonder Years. I thought it was the TV show where you used to dance like this. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. oh, is nice. that Carlton? See, yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, Carlton? Yeah. You see where you're going with it? What happened? <laughs> what? What happened? <laughs> you don't like that dance? <laughs> no, that's not me. All right. I'm just making sure. Hey, anything else we want to add for the GOAT? This is one of you, the most. You got anything you want to promote? Anything you want? Yeah, anything you know, else the, the, you want to throw out here? This no, is I mean, one it, of the best times ever. One of the, the things that I enjoy doing right now, you know, living where I live, is I get to work from my house. I got a little guest house on the property about 40 yards from the main house, and I built a little studio in there. And uh, I do my podcast 83 weeks in there. I've got a YouTube show called Wise, Wise Choices. Uh, but I, I just have fun doing it. It's like you guys. I mean, yeah. I look forward to doing my show every week. And fortunately, it pays the bills. And I get to have fun, stay in touch with wrestling fans. And I, yeah. I just dig it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, same, same with us. We come in here every week. We come in here a few times a week. And we just do these shows with everybody that we want to meet with and people we want to talk to. And this, is, this guy was like the first guy to believe in me when we did this show. So for us to sit down here now, kind of a year into this, build out the studio and everything, it's... It's fun. It's and, amazing. And what's crazy, and I guess it's one of the things that's so fascinating about this world, in addition to all the other stuff you do, which is pretty fascinating, by the way. I got a little taste of that walking in the door. But you guys are just having fun. And when you can have success, whatever that means to you, financially and otherwise, just having fun, I mean, that's real freedom. People yeah. talk about freedom. But when you get up in the morning and do what you love to do, can pay your bills while you're doing it, there's nothing more... Right. Nothing represents freedom more than that to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, hundred percent. It's fun, you know, making fun of him, joking around, stuff like that, and meeting incredible people like you. You know, I never would get a chance because I'm, I'm more of a um, introvert, I guess now, because yeah. I, you know, I'm almost done with my fighting career. I just sit at home, play video games, and hang out with strippers. <laughs> That's why you we're, need more watches. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to, we're trying to get him to slow down on the, on the strippers and spend more time here. He's got a big fight coming up. We can announce it, or we'll wait. Uh, it's, we haven't announced it yet. All right, we're gonna wait. But he's got a big fight coming up. He's gonna be boxing, so we built built this massive gym for him. We got all the trainers here, the physical therapists, and the strength and conditioning coaches, and his boxing coach. And we're trying to do everything we can to support the athletes and the people who come here. And then we get to joke around all day. But realistically, the goal is to build a nice community here at the Jackson House, so that way we can go out there and try to build one of the biggest brands of all time, selling our brand new JX1, our new chains, and everything that goes with it. So I'm super blessed to be able to do this as well. And uh, and I'm not just saying this. Yeah. I mean, you are you're really an impressive young man. I mean, to to first of all to have the vision yeah. that you have is unusual, and then to execute and have fun doing it. Yeah. That's a magic. Yeah, he's a genius. He was a fat kid. And nobody liked him, so all he had to do was just sit down and and plan things out. Then now he he, he got in shape. He want to be Rocky. And <laughs> everything's coming together. My, my first client ever was Rampage Jackson. I was like 19, 20. He believed in the vision. So I told him one day when, when we get it right, we're going to bring it back together and we're going to reunite the band. So when the brand started pulling off and me and my partner were like, all right, it's time to invest in the community and the culture. Vision doesn't work unless everybody buys into it. And mm -hmm. no one buys into it unless they see a little bit come to life every day. 
No one wants to just be sold the same story every day and never see any action. So every time we tell him something, every time we try to do something, he's the first one to believe in it. He believes in it. Everybody rallies behind him. He's an icon in the MMA world. So he was pivotal and, and pivotal in helping us shape our, our team, our coaches, how we put together this gym. He cares more about MMA fighters than anybody I know. So with that being said, it was a lot easier for us to kind of build this as authentically as possible. And then we have a motocross show with Twitch, who's an icon in freestyle motocross, and a skate show with P-Rod, Nija, Sheckler. These are all icons in skating. We bring all those worlds together, wow. and it's a very, very unique community. You know, well, I could tell you, um, I always believed in him because I know he's really good at business. But when I started seeing it, one time I was hanging out in Japan, and some and some young white kids came up to me and that and come, hey, rampage, rampage. I was like, whoa, whoa, you guys are too young to know who I am. How y'all know? He said Jackson and pointing at the head. And that's when I was like, oh wow, wow. That's when I knew, like, yeah, he he was on to something for sure. That's cool. Yeah. We do it as a team, big big community, you know. I, I definitely got a lot of inspiration from what you guys did in wrestling and kind of how you put together an organization and characters and a storyline and staying consistent with that. So a lot of inspiration from you guys. We we love wrestling. And I locked and I watched a lot of that growing up. So learning from you, I definitely appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. This yeah. is really, really fun for me. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank but that you. being said, this is one of the best to ever do it. An icon, an entrepreneur, a visionary himself. Make sure you guys leave a comment. Let us know who you guys want to see next. We're going to be venturing heavy into the wrestling world for the next six months. We're going to be trying to get as many wrestlers as possible. Um, we're definitely going to try to get some, some wrestlers that Rampage is excited about. I don't want to name them. Don't want to throw people off. And uh, make sure you go check out the Jackson Podcast Discord. And we're now available on Spotify. You can listen to us on the way to work. And uh, if our voice is getting too loud, just lower the volume a little bit. But keep listening. Thanks for watching. I'm Bear DeGidio, Rampage Jackson, and the one and only Eric Bischoff. We're the Jackson Podcast.